When you play a poker tournament, 85% of the time you're going home broke. This is part of the game. You, you can't be results oriented where you can play well and lose for a long period of time and you have to be willing to sustain that. Well, how do you learn to deal with the shit that luck is going to throw in your way because, you know, let's face it, <laughs> it's, it's going to throw some stuff your way. Right, you just show up, you study, you still lose, and you show up with a smile again tomorrow. <laughs> I just set out to play poker. I was like, I want to play poker, win at poker, make some friends. Uh, I don't know, get into tournaments, maybe win a big tournament, get rich like everyone else. These people are your friends, but you're trying to kill them. Like, <laughs> like, and then as soon as the game's over, like you're all friends again. They allow you to kind of like step back and say like, I truly fucking love this game. And it's just a lot of fun to sit down against seven opponents, compete, and you know, try to come out on top. Poker has taught me so much about life. I feel like so many decisions that you make off the table can be influenced by the way that you think about poker. Poker was the first time where I was able to fail monetarily, feel really bad about it, and still think it's all right because you can learn from everything. I think it's becoming more a story of resilience. And, and I hope what this entire content project does is I hope it peels back the curtain of our industry a little bit, peels back the curtain of our community, and you get to see like what the best and brightest in this poker industry are all about. Poker is all about chasing your dreams, taking your shot, and changing your life. You don't have to be an athlete, you don't have to be you know in as good a shape as me. You can go out there and uh, you know be anybody and be successful. This is the first pot here at our final table. When you're faced with adversity, you know, champions rise up. You know, it's kind of hard to believe it's been 20 years since my uh, World Series win. Um, some days it seems like it was just yesterday. Other days feels like it's been forever. Um, but my body definitely feels like it's been 20 years. Uh, everything else about it, I mean, it seems like it was yesterday. So, you know, I still feel like that young kid uh, mentally that, that won it that many years ago. The game has changed so much over the years, though. It's just incredible. I mean, it's amazing how two cards can be played so differently over the course of time. And uh, just the, the dynamics and how things have changed, it's, it's pretty surreal. Um, but yeah, it is real, real insane, real crazy that it's been 20 years already. Obviously, very surreal to have an effect named after you, the moneymaker effect. You know, you ignited a, a movement, or you know, you changed the the face of um, a game. Um, you know, back when I won, or uh, before I won, they were shutting down poker rooms. Um, it was hard to find games. It just the game was dying. Um, and then obviously after I won it exploded, it took off in popularity. We went from 800 people to 8,000 people in the main event over the course of two years. Um, and we've been there ever since. Um, poker rooms are opening up and, or have been opened up in every single state almost ever. I mean, just, you can find poker rooms in just about anywhere. So, um, you know, it's obviously a pretty cool thing to, to be able to be a part of that. Uh, obviously I'm not the sole reason, although I should be. Um, but being a part of that really is uh, pretty cool. I don't travel to play tournaments uh, hardly at all just, just to go play tournaments. Uh, it's not really, you know, my cup of tea. Uh, again, I, I'm not looking to travel, so um, if I'm not getting paid, <laughs> I'm probably not gonna be traveling. Um, so there was like almost zero desire for me to, to play in the event. Um, and that was my immediate first reaction. I was like, okay, cool, that'll be a, you know, whatever, a fun tournament. I figured it'd be kind of like the five diamond or whatever. But as time progressed and you started seeing them give away seats, like every single day they were giving away seats to people on my timeline and they kept giving them away and kept giving them away. And then everybody that I know, everybody on my timeline, um, they're all telling me they're going out to play in this event. and. All of a sudden it went from, yeah, there's no way in the world I'm traveling the week before Christmas to go out and play at an event to, well, hell, this is like a, a second main event. How 
did I get into poker? So I got into poker, it had to be 2006, five maybe, I was a big bowler. So I knew nothing about poker. I abhorred gambling, like I wasn't a gambler at all. So I find myself in Wichita visiting some friends one day and noticed on ESPN they had some poker marathon about this guy named Chris Moneymaker, right? So I was like, I'm gonna watch this ESPN marathon a little bit so that I get good at poker so that I can win our bowling league poker games. Like that's literally the only reason I watched anything. Like I said, cause I didn't want to gamble. I was like, gamble, I'm not gambling. Like uh, I turned it on. It was like episode two, I got hooked and I sat and watched the entire, like, <laughs> like Moneymaker's entire run. And it was like right in the middle of the poker boom. So like everybody was doing the exact same thing. Now there is another poker boom, but it's different. It's like, it's more homemade from like the bloggers, like the, the Rampages and Brad's and Andrew's and myself's that are bringing in people ones at a time. So from learning poker to like transitioning into creating content, um, a lot of, like there was a lot of the universe just for me personally, that just convulged at the exact same time. I'm playing a live one, two cash game in St. Louis, which is where I lived at the time. I'm sitting in my one, two cash game. Friend of mine says the trooper's in the room. And I'm like, who the hell is the trooper? Like, I thought he was a cop. Like, I didn't know who this guy was. So she told me to look him up on YouTube. And I just sat there. And again, just like me watching Moneymakers run to greatness, I'm watching this guy walk around the casino filming things. And I'm like, that's cool. Like, I want to try that. So literally the very next day I went to Best Buy, I bought like the super cheap Fisher Price camera. Like it was ridiculous. And I went and tried to vlog uh, just me taking my daughter to Toys R Us. And that's how it all started for me. Like I was like, I can journal and I can like record poker stuff and I can do it like behind the scenes. Like, and I was just inspired. My whole goal was to get good at vlogging like the trooper. Like I just wanted to be the trooper. So, so yeah, then, yeah, modeled after the OG. And then I just went crazy with it, with like the production value that my blog now has and cartoons and like all kinds of stuff. But what table? Four one? Oh, you gave me the four sweat. Where are you? Four a seven. Oh, right. <laughs> four a sweat. <laughs> I got into poker in my high school years. This was when Chris Moneymaker started showing up on ESPN a lot and my friends and I were hooked. So we were hooked on watching all the World Series of Poker episodes and then we were hooked on playing poker right after. So we must have played 800 sit and goes throughout that entire year, which was my junior year of high school. And from there, my growth in poker just just steadily increased. And when I turned 21, I went out to Vegas. And when I turned 22, I played in my first World Series of Poker event. And then I, I, I really got into poker a couple of years ago when I joined the poker broadcasting ranks and started in poker commentary and moved into some sideline reporting and moved into some studio hosting. So it's been a real uh, evolution for me over the last say by now 15 or 20 years or so i'd say i'm pretty focused on both poker and broadcasting so it's nice that they're able to to be combined for me in, in my career selfishly i know i become a better poker player by broadcasting because my job is to watch the very best poker players in the world play the game and i get to sit next to an excellent analyst whether it be Brent Hanks or Maria Ho and Jamie Kerstetter and kind of listen to a true poker pro's thought process, that's naturally going to make me better. So becoming a better broadcaster helps me become a better player and, and vice versa. I think becoming a better player helps me become a better broadcaster. I can set up my analysts in better spots. So it's my own little, little flywheel of sorts, which is really cool for me. <laughs> mean. <laughs> My name is Jamie Kerstetter, I'm commentator for various tours like the World Series of Poker, World Poker Tour, um, and Poker Go, and a bunch of other ones. And I am funny on Twitter, I've been told. And I don't know, I guess I wear a bunch of hats, but I can't think of any more right now. <laughs> Playing poker slightly underage uh, in Atlantic City. My family's from Atlantic City, so um, I played at Tropicana. 
I don't know how I didn't get ID'd, I looked like I was 12. Um, but yeah, I played there a little bit. Um, I ended up playing in underground games in New York City, and then I went to law school in Ann Arbor, close enough to Detroit to go sneak away and play some um, casino games and was in a law school home game. And that's when I started to fall in love with poker. I, th I think probably my lowest moment in poker was the first time I felt myself failing at it and I went back to work. So I had been a lawyer, um, I left and I played poker for two years, but I never really bought into like, I'm a professional poker player. Um, and I always felt like it was at risk. And at one point I had gone on a downswing, I lost some money, I freaked out and got another job. That was one of my lowest poker moments. So I was like, ah, oh, I'll never make it. Like I can't do this. And I went back to work. And it wasn't until I was nine months into that job and studying poker every day that I was like, I don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> like, I want to be a poker player. So it was actually like the lowest point that brought me, it gave me some resolve to um, basically give me energy to study and stuff. Cause I was like, I, I'm choosing poker this time. I didn't just fall into it. Um, I think something that solidified that I was going to be in poker for a long time that I wanted to continue it was getting jobs commentating. It, it came at a really good time because um, my family was pretty against me playing poker for good reason. It's really volatile and like I could be doing other things with my life. Um, I started getting pretty good commentary roles after doing some free streams and some really low paying streams um, and then finally landed on ESPN for the World Series of Poker and it felt like validation, not for myself, like I believed in myself, but it was more that I can go to my mom and be like, look, I'm doing a thing that like other people think is cool, <laughs> that like other people would value and that like it was hard to get that job. Um, and I feel like that helped me just to feel more comfortable with my family and friends to just be like, I'm not just like gambling on blackjack, like I'm doing something actually like worthwhile. My name is Tom Wheaton. I am founder and CEO of Above the Felt, marketing and talent agency, and also the Faded Spade brand. My poker story is a lot like I'm sure many people who were in their early 20s or mid 20s in the early 2000s, the money maker era. So money maker wins the WSOP, all of a sudden poker is mainstream. This guy with the last name money maker who doesn't really play poker won the main event. And um, my journey was literally, I was that guy who got my friends together to play $20 poker tournaments, who would organize different people in Central Florida who had different groups of friends who were playing poker to come together and play 30 person $20 tournaments. That was my origin and I just fell in love with it. So the tournament poker journey happened by design. I had been playing poker tournaments pretty much ever. It was all cash games. But I wanted people in the industry to know like this guy who is starting these businesses is actually a poker player. So instead of playing in some $300, $500 tournaments, part of my personality is like, go big, right? And I was like, I'm gonna play in my first $10,000 tournament. It's like, here's this dude coming into a tournament he should not be playing in against all the biggest crushers, never played a 10K. I remember being so nervous. I remember sitting down at a table with like Darren Elias, Nick Shulman, Kerry Katz, a bunch of other WPT champions, Stephen Chidwick, all these, and I'm like, holy shit, I do not belong here. But I had this belief that you never know. I wound up running deep. I wound up cashing, I finished 19th. Every single year since 2017, I've run deep in a WPT. This year I haven't yet. So coming into this championship, this $10,000, $15 million guaranteed championship, I'm like, this is it. You know, I was telling Darren this, like I still get butterflies and if I ever lose that, then I don't wanna be playing. Fast forward to now, you know, I my volume is very low for poker. I might play six poker tournaments a year, right? Because if I'm playing too many poker tournaments, I'm not being the dad I wanna be. I'm not running the businesses the way I should. It all started because I decided to play this 10K buy-in tournament that I didn't have the money for, but I wanted to give it a shot. And when I got back into the industry and I started becoming part of the community and getting to know so many of the industry's best and brightest players and entrepreneurs and leaders, it really bothered me that people outside of our industry did not know these people, that they did not know them and know how skilled they are and know how amazing they are at their craft and know how much they can offer and bring value outside of our industry. People only knew poker professionals from the boom era, right? Yet there's so many talented people 
authentic, intelligent winners in this industry. I felt this purpose of, I wanna do that and I think I can if I start a marketing and talent agency and bring the right people on. And yeah, we'll get business and help build value in the industry, but it's like at what point are we able to show the world, people who don't have any knowledge of our industry, just how amazing the people within it actually are. When I decided to actually do it, Jamie was the first person I called and she snap called. Um, Berkey was the next person I called because Berkey and I had developed a, a friendship through the years. He really was one of those people that helped connect me in the industry to a lot of his peers um, when he didn't have to do that. Uh, my name is Matt Berkey. I identify myself in the poker community as a professional. I often say that in spite of the fact that no part of me ever wanted to grow up, I was forced to grow up very young. I was caring for my mother by the age of 12. Like the, the adult role was quite reversed in our family dynamic. It's kind of a, a, a weird um, duality that exists whenever I revisit like how I was raised, how I grew up and how I use that as framing for like where I'm at today. Um, I think for a long time, it was just a non-issue because uh, when you're in your 20s, you don't really want to be too vocal about your past, especially like coming up the way that I did. Like there was a lot of embarrassment attached to the way my mother lived her life and uh, the family life that I was exposed to with her being a full blown drug addict and, you know, us basically growing up in poverty. These aren't things that you really want to be bragging about. Right. But when you're in your 30s and you've kind of like solidified your own level of success and security, it becomes a little bit more comfortable to be vulnerable, to talk about it, to hopefully help others who are going through the same sort of struggle. Though there was a lot of struggle interwoven throughout all of that time frame, um, and though I do believe a lot of my modern character was built off of that struggle, the ups were so high. Like I had such a remarkable friend group. I had such an incredible support system around me with my grandparents, uh, my friends' families. Like I was the adopted son in all of uh, my friends' families. They were all hyper aware of what was going on. So though my immediate surroundings may have been a bit dire and uh, seemed like they were a bit more impoverished than the average kid, uh, I, I wasn't very far away from like being able to enjoy the spoils of living a normal life. I guess what always drew me to poker was the creativity, the lack of boundaries, the no limit aspect of it, where you can kind of do anything at any point, And that was always exciting to me. It's pretty easy to remain passionate and driven within the game when you don't really have the access to burn out. I might only get 30 opportunities to play uh, games above 50, 100 all year long, which means I'm probably looking at a sample size of 300 to 600 hours of high stakes poker. That's not very many hours working, right? So I get the rest of the time to enjoy my life, to think very critically about the strategies that I want to employ within the game, but also what I want to be doing with my time away from the table as well. Uh, and those kind of reprieves from the stress of gambling, from the uncertainty of how I'm going to pay my bills tomorrow and uh, all of the things that come with being an up and comer mid stakes grinder, they allow you to kind of like step back and say like, I truly fucking love this game. And it's just a lot of fun to sit down against seven opponents, compete and, you know, try to come out on top. You are allowed to text sales unless you do not have live cards. The white line in front of you is a betting line. We are playing 10 levels. So what was funny was uh, Darren and I wound up sitting right next to each other all day. We are very similar in the way we approach life. I am learning so much from him about tournament poker. I feel like he's learning a lot from me about business. And through that relationship, we formed this bond. Right. 
all the seats we do not and all the fucking turns. This asshole has position on me. Good luck, Tom. Joke on it, Darren. I got into poker when I was young, but really started playing cards, like non-poker games when I was really young with my grandmother. We'd play spades, uh, gin, bridge, things like that. And when I was a teenager, I started playing hearts and spades online. So I, I initially started with other other card games. And then when Moneymaker won the main event, I think it was 2003, I was in high school and we started playing Hold'em in uh, my friend's basement and started playing online and then it kind of snowballed from there where all my card playing became poker. I definitely remember in college playing online when the money started to get real, where I would, initially I'm playing $5, $10 games, it doesn't really matter if you win 20 bucks, but I think sophomore year I was starting to hit some tournament scores like 20,000, 25,000 and kind of like, Oh, I'm gonna. I was up till 2 a.m. playing poker. It's tough to get up for the 5 a.m. morning practice, and uh, after you win 20 grand, so I really those things kind of came to a head in college, where I was playing basically professional poker. I was playing a lot online. I was traveling for live tournaments, so I was starting to miss some practices, and really my sports, the sports area of my life was starting to slack. So I kind of had to choose: am I going to keep playing these sports, which are basically a dead end? I'm not going to be a professional water polo player. Or uh, should I should I really devote more time to poker? And I started started to do poker. I think to be a professional in this industry, you have to have an even keel and not be too emotional. I think I've always kind of been that way. My father's that way. Um, he's a, a college football coach his, his whole life, so kind of always had that uh, edge where I'm willing, I, I'm able to deal with the ups and downs and fine with dealing with the swings and I'm not going to get emotional about it and I think that's a good trait to have as a, as a pro poker player. See when you're back. Live well, manager. See you sir. Come here. Come give me the hug. Give me the hug. I'll be here, I'll be, Tom, I'll be here till Wednesday night. Wednesday night? Yeah, I leave, I leave uh, Thursday, Friday is viewing and then the uh, funeral. Oh my god. So I'll be here. Yeah. Oh, so you're not playing no. at all? No. Well, you're making the right priority. Yeah, family always. Yeah, so I won't be here. Uh, I have a funeral to attend for my grandfather on my dad's side. I want to be there for my family. I want to be there for my dad. And of course, there's the no obligations and I know it's out of the way, but this isn't something that I can miss. I thought that in order to become one of the best poker players in the world and online, I had to spend all of my time doing it. So if that meant all of my time, it means every second of the day that I'm awake. So my schedule turned in from a healthy one, from a lifestyle perspective of going to the gym, eating clean at the cafeteria, to then not leaving my room, and then finding poker as the way that I'm gonna make my life work, because I just loved it so much. Everything took a secondary or tertiary place in my life where poker became number one. My health didn't matter. My relationships didn't matter. Nothing else mattered besides making poker be the thing that I was going to build my identity on. And then being fortunate enough to meet Nick and Chewy and Matt, you realize that there's more to life than just poker. And that's where I'm at now. Back then I spent so much time playing online. It feels like another lifetime ago. And I started getting into poker about three and a half years ago at this point, but it feels like a lifetime ago, like a completely different version of me that's been gone for a long time. But at the same time, that version still stays with me. And I remember grinding for 12 hours a day, not leaving my room, being pretty sad, honestly, and using poker as a vehicle to escape reality, less so than seeing it as a career choice and living it as a lifestyle. Where now I'm sort of evolving into seeing it as a lifestyle, less of an escape. There's always gonna be poker, poker's always gonna be there, but family and when it comes to being with the people you love and trying to make a positive out of it, reconnecting with that side of the family I haven't seen in such a long time that I'm looking forward to going back Obviously, it would be nicer under different circumstances, but making a positive out of that and realizing that poker is not the most important thing. 
Steelers, we are going to require five live players. My name is Maria Konnikova. I am a writer, but when I was working on my last book, um, The Biggest Bluff, I entered the world of professional poker and ended up training with Eric Seidel um, for over a year and got sucked into this life and um, became uh, a professional poker player for some time. These days I no longer consider myself a fully professional poker player, but I'm now a writer who feels very passionately about poker and about the poker community and who sees my life as straddling those two spheres. Poker was never really on my radar at all. The only poker I had ever seen was in the movie Rounders. Like that was the only poker game I'd ever seen. Um, and I fell into it by chance when I wanted to write about luck and the role that luck plays in our lives. And I needed a way to explore that, to figure out, you know, how do you, how do you crack that? How do you tell the story of chance and skill? Um, and I happened to come across um, John von Neumann's seminal book about game theory, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. Um, didn't like the book, but learned that von Neumann was a poker player and that game theory actually came out of poker. And that von Neumann, who was one of these absolutely brilliant minds of the 20th century mathematician, he thought that if you could solve poker, um, you'd have a way of solving strategic decision making. That got me thinking about poker and I thought, you know, hey, Maybe this is my book. Like, what if I learn this game, get someone really, really good to coach me, um, play, see how far I can get, and use that story as a way to look at luck and skill. And that's what I did. I ended up approaching Eric Seidel, um, who I knew from Rounders, <laughs> since, uh, since he was the off-screen star in Rounders with his red visor. And um, he, I was very lucky that he agreed to be a part of the project, and that's how I initially got into poker. I had a lot of theoretical background that's very helpful, obviously, in the poker world, but as Eric told me when we first started working together, you can have all the theoretical background in the world, and we won't know if it will translate or not. Um, and I worked my ass off, but that also doesn't mean that it was going to work out. Um, but then I also got lucky and ended up doing well. Sometimes you just feel it. And I'm still alive, I should have busted. Hey, my name is Ethan Yao, and I started off in poker by making YouTube videos, and uh, I don't even know, my role in poker, I'm a fucking role, I'm just like, <laughs> dumbass. I'm just a dumbass at fucking punt. Something. My name is Ethan Yao, and I make videos on YouTube about poker. I got into poker because I was a degenerate in college. I loved playing blackjack, I loved playing, I loved sports betting. Uh, I got into it by a few college friends that led me down the path of gambling, and I loved it. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of blackjack and sports betting led me down to having my net worth turn into zero, so that was the first time I ever went broke in college. But the cool thing was that I met another friend in college that also played poker, and I learned about this game where you can play against other people versus playing against the house because it turns out you can't really beat the house. So me and my friend drove two and a half hours to the closest casino nearby. That was 18 plus because I was in 21 at the time. And we ended up playing poker. I lost $500 in a snap of 30 minutes. And that was when I had a decision to either really try to get into poker more and learn more about it, or I just completely give up so after that session, I went on YouTube, watched a lot of YouTube vlogs, mainly got inspired by Andrew Nimi, Johnny Vibes, Brad Owen, and Jamin. And watching all those four videos, I learned that there was like a poker niche on YouTube. So I always wanted to be a YouTuber, always wanted to be a content creator. So I took the leap and just played more poker, made more videos, and three and a half years later, uh, things have been going pretty well. Uh, one thing about YouTube is that your relevance and your longevity uh, on the internet could only it's kind of like a ticking time bomb, I guess. You only have a limited time of how long things will go well. So, so far on the channel, things have been growing and who knows how long it's gonna last, but I'm at least cognizant that it won't last forever. But over the next couple of years, I think, uh, I think I just keep hoping things will keep going well. Don't just stop, Jared. Let's let the man get his shot. Bad hands. Back doors. 
So when they announced the first ever WPT World Championship as a $10,000 buy-in, $15 million guaranteed event, it made a statement and gained immediate attention from the community. Because normally these main main tour poker tournaments are on a much smaller level with a 3500 to 5000 buy-in amount, usually somewhere between 1 million and 3 million guaranteed prize pool. But as a 15 million guaranteed tournament, this world championship means they're guaranteeing at least 1500 tournament entrants at the 10k buy-in level. Completely unprecedented in, in the world of, of tournament poker. So to guarantee this amount of money was a strong statement and made this the highest guaranteed poker tournament in history and almost instantly became a can't miss poker tournament for every poker professional and many recreationals as well. You know, day one can be tough. You know, at the end of the day, you're gonna play 12 hours of poker and it was gonna be very difficult for a lot of us to make it through day two. It's just like a numbers game, right? My preparation for the tournament, and I know this is probably gonna sound backwards, my preparation for the tournament was to not think about the tournament, was to just eat, eat some stuff and like sleep longer and then just, go in and then just try to like use my natural poker prowess to just kind of navigate day one. The vast majority of the team made it to day two, which shouldn't have necessarily happened from a number standpoint. I mean, at least half of us should have been knocked out, right? All right, so one level left in the evening. I have, just count it, 92,000. We started the day with 100,000, but that's okay because We've done more with less, we've done less with more. It's going fine, it's been up and down. Um, I have around 165K right now, which is just about average. Um, I peaked at around 270 and then had some bad hands, but you know what, two hours left, anything can happen. <laughs> day two, man. Like, the end of day one was rough. Came back from dinner break, had crumbs, double up, had a stack. Then they started the countdown for the last three hands, and we lost the flip. Now we're on crumbs again. But we have 10 bigs. We're coming back for day two. We'll just do the thing. This is what we do. <laughs> I mean, obviously, anytime you, you bag a good stack coming out of day one, you feel pretty good. I mean, um, I was playing pretty well. Um, my, my first table wasn't that great, um, but I got into a groove and started building my stack. Um, unfortunately for me, I moved like four times in the last two levels, so I could never really get into a good groove. So I peaked at about uh, 380,000. I think I You're bagged 315. <laughs> How's day one going so far? Uh, so far, good. I got like 300 and something thousand, so nice. There's one spot where I got real lucky. But uh, you gotta get lucky in these things sometimes. Yeah. But it was so cool because we all had our stories during day one. We all experienced it together. And with the vast majority of us making day two, it was kind of exciting because while poker is an individual game, like anytime you can bring a team of support system around it to lift each other up, 
especially in poker, which can be a game of failure, it just makes it a bit more special. All right, let's go on the day two. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go sweat even. What are you doing, Dave? <laughs> He's throwing shit down. Just throwing, just throwing shit down. How you been, man? Long time no see. Long time. Yeah, yeah. very long time. What from, was from the first again? Shalom. That's right, Shalom. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be honest, like, as we were midway through day two, I thought for sure I was going to make a deep run. And then all of a sudden the wheels fell off. It's going to be a long day. Uh, 57K, which is like nine bigs. Life support for some. Plenty for me. Plenty. I'm here. How you feeling today? Uh, I was better till Philip showed up. Hello. <laughs> I have 66k. You feel fine. Yeah, but now I actually have to like you know think about what you do pre-flop because you're good. So we all went into this day two with some high hopes, right? Like someone's gonna make a run at this thing. One of us is gonna go deep. Like, this is the start of continuing to tell this world championship story of our squad. And man, <laughs> within the first level, it was like dominoes, like Jamin knocked out. We got queens in versus ace king, and they got us. They got us for all our chips. So, so at least we weren't here all day. Jeff knocked out. All right, that's it, end of the road. A pair of eights, pocket eights, not a terrible hint. Got the chips in against the King Jack suited. And they haven't hit. Yeah, oh no, indeed. Oh no, oh, no indeed. Uh, spoiler alert, oh no. The turn was king. No good. So, that's it. The journey ends. The dream dies. <laughs> the road is, you know, is over. But I still get to do commentary later, so. I'll still be around. You can't get rid of me quite yet. Berkey knocked out. I'm knocked out. Dream is dead. Dream is over. Uh, 15 bigs. I open shove with jacks. Tens. Reshoves. Guy wakes up with kings. Tens and jacks are out. It is what it is. I'm gonna go cry myself to sleep. Well, shit, we didn't see that happening. And it's like, all right, it's up to you, Chris, and Darren and Maria to like make these runs, right? How are you doing so far? Uh, sort of like 400 down to about 300. So not the best start, but good table. Stay six days early. So. Hanging in there? Yeah, we'll see you. I will try not to join the rest of the team. <laughs> Please don't. Please don't. And then like the next level, Maria's knocked out. Would I have shoved Jax again for 16 big blinds? Absolutely. You know, it turns out I ran into Kings, but that's the absolute right decision in that moment. Um, so I'm happy with how I played. I have no regrets. The next level, Money Maker's knocked out. Good luck, guys. Oh, oh. Good luck, guys. So much for this year. I'm Mike. We still got Darren. We got Darren, the four-time WPT champ, the GOAT. He's gonna make this run. It's gonna be part of the story. Last level of the night, the guy runs into aces twice, two hands in a row, and he's out, right?
yeah, having chips in a tournament like that, it's always going to be, I wanna say depressing, but it's always gonna be sad when you get knocked out. It sort of like reminds me of the main event where you get like one shot a year and it's always a sad day when you bust it, but I'm always good at kind of separating it and did I run bad or did I play bad or, or self-evaluating my play is kind of what I'm going to base um, my mood and my, my how, how I feel about it based on my play and not the results. So being able to kind of be objective and self-evaluate your play is really important. Honestly, I don't deal well with the struggles and the emotions of tournament poker. I, I think the way that I've always viewed tournaments is uh, a, a bit of my recreation. I know that as a, as a career professional, that's not the right approach. But I think it's the only thing that can allow me to continually play them and chase the EV that they offer. And because of that, I do have that kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say beginner's mindset, but like that, that certain like wistfulness where uh, I sit down at the table and I truly do think that like, I'm just going to win $4 million today because I'm still in this thing, you know? And uh, I think... Being around for 20 years, you've seen it all. You've run every big flip in every massive EV spot that you could ever imagine, and you just kind of become numb to it all. But until the actual moment occurs where you're all in for your tournament life in a 60, 40, 50, 50, whatever, uh, you truly do believe that you're gonna find a way to navigate and not deal with the pain. It wasn't an ideal situation. It was a big opportunity we all missed out on in the highest guaranteed poker tournament in history, what do you do? You dust yourself off, you get your ass up, and you go register for the mystery bounty. And you get after it again, because that's what the best and brightest do in this industry. So a few days ago, um, I played in the ladies event here at the Win, which was I think the largest ladies event I've ever played in that was not the World Series. So they really did an amazing job. I've noticed that in general, the play at the ladies event has, has gotten better um, since you know since I've been in poker, which is great. Um, and you know the players have gotten better, like Jamie, who's one of my uh, teammates at Above the Felt, uh, has actually made the final table. I've known Jamie Kerstetter for, for probably close to the longest out of anybody because I started working with her pretty early when I got into this business. And you know, it's like once Jamie makes fun of you, you're kind of in. You know, having people like Jamie at the table, while it can be frustrating because she is actually not a bad poker player, it is pretty fun because she has a pretty good sense of humor and it, it does lighten the mood at the table. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't know Jamie made a final table. Good for her. I mean, it's the first I've ever heard of it, but... It would be amazing if she won. You know, she's just such a great person and so good for poker and just joy and sunshine. Is, and she's hilarious, which is great. Um, so I really hope she wins. Anybody that knows Jamie knows that uh, she's a really big advocate for women in poker. Um, and also, she's just a, a really great human and she's really funny. So someone like her making the final table at the first ever women's event is just on the WPT is, is, is really incredible. She represents this game so well and she's a, a pioneer of sorts, is an incredible um, commentator, poker personality, and she's just a bright and creative light uh, in the industry overall. First thought I had when, when she made the final table was this is going to be awesome for poker because she's got a great personality and she's fun to watch. Now she just has to play poker. Jamie Kerstetter. Hello and welcome.
Welcome live from Las Vegas. We are covering the ladies championship here at the WPT World Championship. Again, all the women, you know, this final title, I mean, look at this. Mm -hmm. Just, I can't wait for this to air, to be shown to millions and millions of people around the yes. world. And yeah. It's very cool and very exciting. Um, that's actually one of the really good parts about having commentated a lot of final tables and having played over a decade of online poker. That does not keep me up at night. If I know something's a good shove, I just shove. Um, and it's it's in God's hands after that if I'm gonna end up beating in the tournament still or not. They don't wanna go. For Cindy to get away from, although she is deliberating here. She has her absolutely crushed, and you can navigate post fall. But in this case, unfortunately, the worst hand folds. But Jamie does pick up a few big blinds. I think she has some fans in the crowd as well. Sounds like it. All in from the small blind. At the point that I was dealt the 10 8 suited, I had just been blinding down. I didn't have any decisions. I didn't have a shot. So um, just getting dealt the hand that good with only one opponent to get through, a no brainer. I can sit here after I bust, right? <laughs> <laughs> Flop is the king eight three. <laughs> Brutal. Jamie now needing a ten or an eight. Hey, I made a pair today. To save Woo! her tournament life. <laughs> hey. Aw. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> Turn card. Turn is six of diamonds. Not gonna help her. She has five outs leading into this river. Four of hearts on the river. Good luck. That is going luck, to send Jamie home with just over $21,000. I'm happy with how I played. I was really proud of how I played day two of that tournament. Um, having all my friends there, having my WPT coworkers there was just so nice. Um, that was maybe the only <laughs> pang of regret, um, is feeling like, oh, these, all these people came to support me. I would have loved to give them a, a chance to be in a winner's photo instead of getting sick. But really, like, there wasn't a lot I could have done. Thank you. I still think that there's a long way to go before women are treated as equals at the poker table. Even today, after, you know, I, I do think that some progress has been made, but we're still only 2-3% of any given field. People still play against women as women um, and don't necessarily see them as equals. Like, you know, there is still this perception of, oh, good poker players and then good female poker players. And I would love to be in a world where that modifier does not exist, right? Where we just, where people look at us not like we have two heads but like oh here's another poker player remember what it was like when i started to play 15 years ago no women were in the poker room you go in everyone's like who's that person and it's like you feel like an alien it's crazy um and i never experienced that before so trying to fix that for other people who might want to come in taking out that first hurdle and making the rooms comfortable for women um, is important to me people say oh we've done a lot for women in poker we've marketed to women in poker they're just not coming. They're just not ever going to be more of X percent of the field. We're proving it wrong. It's just not true. So I think these efforts to actually like try to um, reach this part of the population that seemed like it wasn't interested in poker, um, it's finally changing and evolving. I think more women are behind the scenes working on it. Um, and we had 6% of the 10K fields um, in the championship event be women. So we are reaching women. It's been a long uh, journey to this point, but I think we're getting there. One day, you know, I hope that people, you know, like me, like Jamie, like women in the game can actually get enough mass and enough of a voice um, to flip that. Um, I think we're working on it, and at some point we'll hit that switch. I'm just sitting over there folding. I didn't mean to, I just kind of like, you know what I'm saying? Like I literally had been in like two hands since birth. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> Well played. Who invited huh. you? Hey, you're not exactly crushing it out here, Jeff. I, right, no, I'm a little aware of the history, you know. There's some blemishes on both of our records. Anyone on the team that you would want to play heads up for, like, say, the main event, heads up. Anyone on the team? Matt, for sure. It's got to be Matt. It's got to be Matt. It's always Matt. Can you elaborate? I mean, we live together. He's been such a positive influence on my life. It would be a real 
dream and comedy skit, honestly, to play Matt in the main. Yeah, well, because that's he's young and he's competitive and he wants to do nothing more than bury the old man. I have no ego about me whatsoever. It's like, who's the easiest match? Tom, give it to me. In rank order, uh, you know, obviously Tom, he's an amateur, so I certainly want to play him heads up first. Uh, and then probably Moneymaker next. Uh, he's somehow older and more washed than I am, which is tough to do at this stage. I'll be honest, like, any of them will work for different reasons. Um, one, I mean, I don't really think any of them are really that good at poker. Um, so I, I would be happy to play any of them. If I could pick anybody on the Above the Felt team to play heads up against, I would, if I had a list, let's say, the number one spot would be Chris Moneymaker. The number two spot would, would be Chris Moneymaker. The number three, et cetera, et cetera, you see where I'm going here, it'd be Chris Moneymaker all day, every day. I am terrified of everybody else on the Above the Felt team, but Moneymaker, bring it, let's go. If I wanted to win, like if winning was my goal, oh, Curse Center, no problem. <laughs> like, Curse Center, no problem. Uh, yeah, I'm just better than her. <laughs> in every way, in every discipline, in everything. Like. <laughs> if I got to play heads up with anyone above the felt, I mean, there's so many to choose from. Like, none of us can play poker for shit. Uh, I think probably Moneymaker would be fun for the banter. Same thing with Jeff Platt. We have almost like a sibling rivalry thing going on. Um, who else? Uh, I don't know, that would be it, I think. I think I made my choices. Sorry to them, but I feel like they're easy money. Her poker mindset is not where it needs to be, so um, maybe she can work on that now. She's got the, the, the funniness down and all, all the personality in the world, but if she actually could play poker, wow, well, it'd be a really sick combination. You know, obviously Rampage would be pretty cool too. I mean, he's had a lot of success, you know, pretty high on life, um, but you know, I've never actually sat at a table with them, so it'd be fun to knock them down a rung or two. The person that I want to play heads up against the most, it depends if this is like for money or, or just for fun. Because for money, I'd probably want to play, for money then I'd probably want to play whoever I think would be the worst at heads up. And then for fun is probably against who I think would be the best at heads up. And I guess the top two players who are best at heads up would either be Darren or Landon, because they both put a lot of work into it. It's Darren Elias, man. It's my boy. Because if I somehow were able to beat him, I will never, ever let him live that down. For the rest of our lives, the rest of our friendship, the rest of the time we're working together, I will always be able to hang that over his head at any time. So give me the best tournament player, in my opinion, of our generation. Let's go, Darren Elias, heads up. I luck box it a three hour to win and I get to hold it over his head for the remainder of, uh, of our lives. <laughs> um, man, who won above the felt would I like heads up? I mean, beating Tom would be fun or Moneymaker. I guess Tom or Moneymaker, either one of those, those old heads I'd love to get a crack at. <laughs> yeah, the chemistry that we have as a team is important, but the individual chemistry between me and each person is super important. I was very fortunate that there was already chemistry with a lot of the folks we brought on. And with the folks I did bring on, I knew there was chemistry and so did they right away. And I met Tom at Matt's house when he came over. We're hanging out at Berkey's house. We're hungry, I'm like, here's my card. Why don't you get us some Uber Eats? I got a Greek salad with extra meat and it's a lot of food. For just the two of us, then the dude orders $150 of Greek food. It's like, oh. That was the first time I met Tom. And from there, he and I just always had a good relationship. But like, I got to know him. I, he's just such a genuine young man. He's a rising star in the industry. And I remember asking him like, would you want to work with me to help, you know, grow your influence? And I was like, well, I trust you. And sure, why not? And from there, now we have this. And it's really a blessing and honor to be a part of it. And I can't thank Tom enough for thinking of me and putting me in the position to not only represent myself, but to represent him and the company that he keeps. Um, Above the Felt is a very good group of people. I'm very happy to be in it, despite what I say in group chat about all of them. Uh, working with Tom specifically has always been a treat. Uh, he and I just kind of like hit it off when we first met a few years ago. He had this big 
vision for what he wanted to do within the poker space and you know he has this idea of wanting to be the Vince McMahon of poker and like you know I don't want to be the one to spoil it that he doesn't have that swag but you know he's Vince McMahon adjacent uh, and I really believe in that sort of like big picture vision. I think that this space is capable of a lot more than what we're doing right now. And we exchanged a lot of big ideas and I, I just like the trajectory uh, by which he was trying to, to, to enter the space. It's a really just nice group of people, right? No assholes. Um, it's, uh, everyone is nice. Everyone um, adds something interesting. What I like is that it's not like we're a group of grinders. Um, and I say grinders now in a good, in a good way, not like, you know, people who think it's a grind, but like people who just play poker, right? We're people who also do other things and for whom poker is just part of kind of a part of a way of life where it just fits into um, a lot of other different activities. And I think we're also all people who promote the game to very different audiences. At some point though, when you're in the industry for so long, I've been in for 15 years, I do think you get experience and your opinions matter. Um, you can start guiding people and like companies like, hey, it'd be really cool if you would do this for players. Players really want this. And you start to have influence whether you set out to or not. I've never really enjoyed the spotlight. It's not like something I, I just, like achieved to get or anything like that. But you're gonna be asked to do interviews. You're gonna, you're gonna have pictures, autographs, things like that. And you can either fight it and be a dick, or, which some people do, or you just kind of accept it. Like, this is something I'm gonna have to do. Maybe this brightens this person's day or makes this media person's job easier. Like, my whole life, my whole career, my only focus has really been play poker, win money. Like, that's kind of all I had thought about until I had met Tom. And Tom kind of opened my eyes to opportunities and things that are out there. And also has given me more reach to make change with, within the industry, which, which I like. It definitely accelerated my progress as a poker player. A hundred percent. Again, just having access to these other um, poker minds that are stronger than mine. Uh, I mean, not Moneymaker. Like, he ain't helped. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when you see guys like Rampage and uh, Landon, uh, Brad Owen, those, those guys, they're really putting out content that is getting those, that younger generation back into poker. It's, it's a lot of hard work, but they're doing it and they're making the game grow. And, uh, you know, a lot of appreciation for them because I, I did it for a long time in a different way, but I know what they're going through. And uh, one, it's a lot of work, but I know they're having a lot of fun too. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool little ride to go on. Honestly, at the end of the day, this isn't work what we do. Um, I love playing poker. I know they love playing poker. They enjoy doing what they're doing. Um, you know, it, it's definitely, you know, a blessing to be able to influence people and to, you know, connect with people like this. I feel like I'm fortunate enough to be the link between the viewers and the players. And I gotta tell you, like, I love every minute of it. My friends will make fun of me just because they say I love the attention and I love the camera. And part of that is true. But I do really, really like connecting with the poker community because I feel like we're just, we're just attached. And we've been attached for the last few years that I, I've been a poker broadcaster. So I'm just, I'm lucky to be able to say that I'm any kind of ambassador or influencer. And to have any kind of positive impact on this game means a lot to me because it's a game that I, I do truly care for. Being a brand ambassador, influencer, however you want to qualify it, uh, is very uncomfortable to me. It's not something, like seeking the limelight is definitely not something I've ever really yearned for. Um, developing a brand, uh, being a part of something bigger than yourself, uh, be it the brand that you're developing or something like Above the Felt, it's, it's a lot of responsibility. And I think for most, they don't understand necessarily what they're signing up for. You have to carve out extra time to, to make sure that you're shaking hands, that you're getting to know the people who are supporting you on the regular, and that you're supportive of their dreams too. If the opportunity arises where somebody who is a follower, who is on a rocket ship up, can find me and tell me like, hey man, I started watching you during the pandemic. It really got me through a lot of the boring hours and now suddenly I find myself grinding 2550. Never thought I would be here. That's a fucking story I wanna hear. It's very easy 
to just be like getting your dick kicked in at the table and then have two people see you on break when all you have to do is piss and forget like this is more important, you know? Sometimes I meet people and they'll say, oh, I want to be a professional like you, um, um, you're an inspiration and things like that. And I'm always inspired by the, the new players and the enthusiasm they have for the game because as a professional for almost 20 years, we get a little jaded to all the success and the swings and start to become a bit uh, dead inside to all of this. So while I may inspire them in that way, I'm inspired by the new player and his enthusiasm for the game and to be so excited about it. And like That really inspires me when I see that in people. I feel like a lot of people have asked me what it's like to have a big YouTube channel or whatever it may be. But from my understanding and perspective, like, 100 plus thousand subscribers is like just a very very small fish in this pond like people don't really call them like in the youtube space people don't really call them professional youtubers unless they hit a million and when they hit a million subscribers that's when they like can say hey like i'm kind of a small youtuber but in the poker space because it's such a small niche then i guess i have a relatively large impact because it's a growing market and growing industry i personally don't think i do i i still personally see see myself as just some random guy punting in poker and people like watching my punts and stuff and it's entertaining at the very least. So that's what I provide. Uh, end of the day, I'm just trying to provide some entertainment. I think that's the whole point. That's why everyone wants to play poker. It's Bama, man. It's up, Bama. See you, man. I'm, I let's, end it, let's end it at or not and then let's talk about last night. Because yeah. last night was fun. Yeah, that was Yeah, it was great. Did you go? Oh. And uh, lost the... Um, and then uh, button rolled over Jack High and he looks back at his hand and he looks. So while this story of the world championship was happening for all of us, there was the side story none of us anticipated that one of our crew, Ethan, making a run in a $25,000 high roller tournament. Yeah, these 25K tournaments are really new to me. Uh, as someone who's only played poker for like three and a half years, of course, not many people actually play 25Ks, I guess it turns out. Here at the win, this 25K that happened, I just landed in Vegas and I knew this was an option and potentially a tournament that I could play. And I had a number in my mind where if it got anywhere close to 100 entrants, then I would hop into it. And well, it did. It got really close to it when I entered about like 80 players in and I tried to sell action because I'm not bankrolled to play in $25,000 tournaments. I sold a little bit of action on State Kings last minute as much as I could. I just know that when there's 100 entrants, you know that they're not all going to be pros. There's going to be some recreational players and I won't be the worst player in the field. So at least there's a shot and anyone can win all ins. So I hopped in, played, I busted in 40 minutes and then there was dinner break and I had like an hour, give or take, to kind of figure out if I wanted to rebuy or not. I busted. Seven deuce. I Other guy him, had seven deuce. I told my buddy. He's I don't know. He decided, he decided to call. He's gonna fire huh? again day one C. Ace tap. Like 200k. Yeah. And then win the tournament. It's a flip. <laughs> I didn't initially plan on it. Somehow, some way during dinner, I thought more and more about it. I looked at the field. I felt like you can always max late reg, 20 big blinds. You can't really mess that up that much. And all you can do is take a shot, gamble, and hope for the best. So. I thought it was a good opportunity to do it. Also, I already had like half of a video uh, recorded and filled out. If I wasn't gonna fire a second bullet, then like all that content from the first bullet would have been gone to waste. Let's just bet on myself and see what happens. These high rollers are no joke. And first of all, $25,000 is no joke. Ethan took a big risk, right? But he believes in himself. These high rollers are full of the best poker players in our industry folks that know GTO, Game Theory Optimal, left and right, who do this for a living, that have the bank rolls, that have the backing, that have the swaps. These are like the high rollers of our industry. The major difference between the 25K high roller and the WPT main event is uh, just sheer numbers. So the skill in the 25K is gonna be heavily concentrated. Uh, there's only 108 players. The WPT 10K main event has nearly 3,000. If I were to teach someone how to play a high roller and I set them out to go play a $600 buy-in event, they would get destroyed. They would not work. At the same time, if I taught, if you have a $600 player go and play in a high roller, they would get destroyed there because it wouldn't work. The, the two games are very, very different. Yeah, a tournament like the 25K with so fewer entrants 
there's going to be less players kind of in the middling skill tiers where you're going to get very good professionals in the 25k being it's more likely you'll encounter very good players at your table in a 25k so being able to to deal with good players becomes an important skill to have in a field like that the only two people that played in it were darren and ethan Berkey can do it, but if Berkey's going to put 25000 on the table, it'll be in a cash game, right? That's just his forte. So it was Darren and Ethan. And Darren's tournament was cut short, right? But slowly but surely, I remember, like, we're all just paying attention to the results while we're playing day 1A. But Ethan's still in there. There's the famous Jeff Blatt. Oh, there's the even more famous guy. Someone just told me they did you say even more famous? famous? I'm alive. It's sick. There I don't want to be crazy, but I watch both of you guys vlog like all the time. Good luck today. Good luck today. Good luck today. The bank challenge is awesome. It's all this cash. Day two of the 25k today, starting in like 20 minutes. 18 players in, 11 players make the money, and I'm like middling stack, so it's a big sweat. Hopefully for a big cash, $900,000 for first place. So I don't know, I don't know. There's a sweat. I, I've never been this nervous before uh, a tournament right now. Day two of the 25K. It's like a really big spot. I have all of myself. Min cash is 3x the buy-in. Like, variance is high. I, I got to play well and hopefully run good. We're all turning around to look at the feature table to see if Ethan's still sitting down. It's getting close to the money. Ethan's still in there. Oh shit, he's got no chips. All right, situation right now. Sweat, 14 players left. There's like one short stack. The other short stack of my table just doubled. 11 people make the money. I'm like in the middle. I'm like tied with like six other people for the same amount of chips. It's a fucking shit show right now. Chips are on the stone bubble right now. So next person to bust gets zero. And then everyone else will lock up a min cash. It's not really min cash, it's 3x, 72,000. I have nine big blinds. Someone down there has like nine big blinds. Fuck. Go ahead and say, Go ahead and say, I dump it face to face with the devil. Work under pressure, not left in the rebel. If you group up with the odds, all against you, but still you broke even and went up in levels, then go ahead and say, Go ahead and say, Best would never in our favor. Still we last longer than those that have forged. Tell the cards that they gave us. Still we successful when no one supported. Feel you have to step our game up. Winning and killers just made us so strong. Greatness is what we made of. If they don't hand it to us, then we forced them. After the war, everything's clear. They think it's over, look at the smoke, and we gon' be there. Site Open, Helio Fox Jam, Rampage Call, Ladies Table. Wow. Helio with the pocket ace. So Rampage looking to hold here with the Mama Seaters. Like he's playing around 500k. Nine. Oof. Clean run out. Seven of hearts is also a bit of a tease. <laughs> Clean run out for Rampage. Yeah. And he was like, okay, whatever. Sorry, we're just going to jump back into Ooh. this as uh, we've got a little 10 wow. 9 against Queens. The offsuit 9 river. Sick. Teach me. Sick. Who had the 10 9? Felipe. Did Rampage have the 10 yeah, 9? Yeah, Rampage with the 10 oh 9. Oh my god. Rocking what a tear. The luck box merchandise and just showcasing that in true fashion. So we are down to nine. The final table will know, be set. Like, once he made the money, we're like, he could do something here. He has no fear. He could make a run at this thing. He is the type of player who is going to play for first. And he might be knocked out first in the money or he might actually make a run at this thing. No matter what happens, I feel pretty happy with the outcome because I was such a short stack. I was on the bubble and I was by far the shortest stack and basically the odds were against me and there was no way I was going to survive. And then there's a turning point where it went from I'm happy to be here and I'm happy with whatever result 
and it flipped to, I want to win this now, and I better win this damn thing now. Ladies and gentlemen, we are live from the win in Las Vegas. All eyes in the poker world gonna be on that young man in seat seven, Rampage. Just kind of, you know, just flicking in 25K, 100% of himself. Second, second ever 25k. You absolutely love to see it. This is a this is a guy who two years ago was playing, grinding the two five no limit game, yeah. making vlogs, and as the vlogs became more and more successful, he parlayed that into taking some shots, and the shots went well, and now he's become a mainstay in the highest stakes game. It's been a truly meteoric rise for, for Rampage for sure. I'm taking 100% of yourself in a 25k, 890. How do you not root for the man? That's it. <laughs> How can you not? There's eight players left. Uh, I'm second in chips, but I have 33 bigs, which is like nothing. So variance will be high. Seventh place locks up a six-figure store, which is fantastic. And this is like the biggest spot of my entire fucking life. So uh, nerve-wracking. I'll be happy with whatever happens, but um, let's just try to spin it up. From Rampage, by the way, on this turn card. Big fan of this. Yeah, this is... Certainly a Rampage card more than a Kevin card. Although Kevin's opening so wide on the button in this particular situation, he's going to have a lot more sevens than he normally would. Uh, still, when Rampage check calls the flop, he's... Um, and for Kevin, the flush got there, but you do have a blocker to the flush. Wow! Go. Rampage! Rampage. Getting one through up to 3.5 million. Second in chips now. How'd you like him now, chat? Regardless of what happened. Ooh. Oh no. Jack of Hearts, Kevin, with a 100% lock on the turn. Go. He finds the check. It's really nice. That's what I'd expect, something between Six and seven hundred, or five and six hundred, five and seven hundred. I mean, five fifty. Okay, you're you're not loving that turn card. You're, in fact, you're probably hating that turn card. But the price is so good. Yeah. And you could beat a lot of the hands that are doing that. So you could beat basically every hand that's doing that. So. Oh, what? rampage! What? Rampage poker. What just happened? Naughty little fold on the turn there. Rampage is playing his face off today. Rampage really trying to convert that win. Oh, I mean, of course they did. That is that is an insane fall. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It's a, it's a... Oh boy. Whoa. Taylor setting the trap with the ace nine, and this could get us two heads up if Rampage can convert that thirty-seven percent against the ace nine of Taylor to get us to heads up play. Taylor looking to hold and well, whoa. how about a not flush draw? The Rampage of Club would leave him drawing dead and well, Jack of Diamonds on the turn and all of a sudden, Taylor finds himself one card away from elimination. The good news is he does have 13 outs. And the river gives Rampage two pair and just like that, we lose Taylor Powell in third place. Going to be going home with $328,000. Rampage heads up <laughs> against one of the best. No limit hold'em heads up players in the world. Kevin Rabichow. You have a quarter million dollars locked up. I am now in the black for <laughs> tournaments this year. So far. That is until I fired in the 10K. I am in the black <laughs> my mindset has always been like especially in tournaments this is definitely not a healthy one but if i don't win the tournament then i'm not achieving my goal because the whole point of entering into a tournament is to win the damn thing oh, saying you wanted the rampage v kevin heads up match well you got what you asked for 894 000 for the win Shouts and heads up coaching across the table. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're asking me for right now? Yeah. <laughs> I think you'd need to pay me more than usual already. And then use seven to the top. Makes sense to go for the jam, just kind of spinning the wheel. 
well as winning pre-flop, not having to do with playing post. Kind of a sharp <laughs> strategy, honestly. hands here. Queen Jack suited for Kevin on the bottom, starting off the hand. 24 big lines effective. Rampage with King Jack of Hearts in the big. Has Kevin outpipped by one on this one. 24 bigs. Make off. Does make the call wow. and has himself in rough shape as he gets shown the King Jack suited. Rampage, by the way, chat, was down to seven big blinds on the bubble. On the stone bubble was the shortest stack. Was nursing a seven big blind stack for the better part of two hours. Now finds himself two cards away from claiming victory here in the WPT 25k high roller. That's, that's a card. That is a card. Let me just pay One card to come for the win. Four diamonds. A rampage poker. Closing things out here. WPT 25k high roller for a career best cash of $894,000. I just know the journey he's been on. I know what something like that can do to catapult his influence, his confidence. I felt a sense of gratitude. I felt a sense of excitement for him. And as weird as it sounds, like I was proud. Tried to sell some action last minute to a few friends. Mike, Joe, they both said no. They thought that I would snap bust. Luckily, that did not. And I get to laugh in their face every single time. That is great for poker. Buddy. That is great for poker. <laughs> Even winning the 25k is very subtly probably one of his lifetime defining moments, or at least career defining moments, um, that he won't realize until many, many, many years down the line. And the reason I say that is because uh, having a windfall of nearly a million dollars at the young age of 25, I believe, it really does set you up to have the freedom to do whatever you want moving forward. And all of those paths have different ceilings attached to them. Whether he wants to pursue high rollers or high stakes cash or a mix of both or move all out of poker altogether and into another uh, career field. Like he has the liberty to take the time and figure that out uh, and he's young enough where he's really risking nothing in doing so so when you have someone like rampage win a high roller it's obviously a really big thing for the industry again you know guys like rampage they're the new influencers that are, are bringing people into the game that are in you know getting the younger generation i mean you know i don't have 18 to 21 24 year olds watching me play poker anymore i mean I've got the old guys watching me, but the, the young guys, I mean, I, I can't really relate with them as much. Rampage does. Rampage does a really good job of, of relating with that audience and really bringing in that newer generation of poker and uh, people that can relate with him and see, you know, his um, trials and tribulations along the way and can relate with that when he goes and wins a high roller. Well, it's kind of the same thing when I won. People see themselves in him, and they know that, you know, if he can do it, they can, you know, on that level, then they can do it as well. And it just gives people hope and inspiration, and that's what grows the game. So, uh, assuming that he's somewhat conscientious of this and doesn't burn through the cash, kind of continuing to fire off in an irresponsible manner as he did in this 25K, which, you know, I'm sure he would openly admit to, uh, if he becomes a little bit more conservative and protect the fact that he has built wealth, it's really only uphill from here. And he kind of has his whole life in front of him to figure out how he chooses to grow uh, both his wealth and his, his personal being moving forward.
yeah, the, the past couple years have been pretty cool. It's been a pretty insane ride, obviously. Uh, climbing the ranks from being a 1-3 grinder up to 2-5 and, and slowly moving up in stakes. Kind of made a leap and just took big shots of myself. So mainly I got really lucky with binking a few tournaments. Uh, my first ever big tournament I ever played on WSOP Online. I won that one for a good chunk of my first bracelet. That was when I never knew any tournament strategy or anything. Then fast forward almost a year later, I played a Venetian tournament and I banked that one for another six figure score. So because of that, that really helped me build a bankroll and I was just really aggressive and shot taking. I had no sense of bankroll management and luckily being as risk on as I am, it kind of paid off and I had some growing pains at the very beginning. I kind of got whacked every single time I took a big leap, but just stubborn and dumb enough to just continually betting on myself playing way outside my bankroll and comfort zone, but uh, end of the day, it ended up working out for now. We'll see at the very least, but I've had a pretty good year so far in poker and things are going well. So it's been a wild journey. Just have always bet on myself and maybe being a little too reckless. There's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to people outside of poker and what poker really is. And, you know, like when you talk sponsorships and, um, you know, just anything outside of, of poker, people don't really understand um, because they're going to see poker as what you see on TV. A bunch of, you know, ace king versus queens, a bunch of flips, a bunch of all ends, a bunch of action a bunch of adrenaline, a bunch of gambling. Perception outside the industry, of our industry, I think is misguided. I think it's wrong. You have so many people who just lump in the poker community with the casino industry. And I get it because so many poker rooms are inside casinos, right? But there is a huge difference. And, and I wish I could stress this. I wish everybody outside the industry knew what I knew about this community. The casino business, the house is always going to win, period. You might get lucky, you might bink a slot, you might win at craps that night, but long-term, you are playing in the house. It is always going to win. But that's not really what it is. Um, from an outside perspective, poker is a long-term game. We're not gambling, we're not trying to count cards, we're, we're reading people, we're, we're engaging with people. Poker is a player versus player competition. And the poker business, they only earn their revenue through service. It's a service industry. It's not a gambling industry. It's a competitive industry. It's a service industry. Poker rooms make their money by, hey, you know what? We're running this tournament. It's a $1,000 tournament. There's going to be a $100 entry fee, service fee. They got to pay their dealers, their staff, etc. There's not a lot of profit in that. When you are playing poker, you are competing against somebody else. And is there luck involved? Of course, just like any sport, there's gonna be an element of luck involved, but the best in the game will come out on top and win long-term, and anybody can become great. That's something that I hope people just, at some point, will get through their heads, that it's not like we are a group of degenerate gamblers um, that's just like trying to get an adrenaline high, that this is actually like a very interesting intellectual game, and that poker players are pretty fucking smart. Like, there are some brilliant people in the game. I've met people who could just do anything, right? They have, you know, I have a PhD, there are other people who have PhDs, there are people, they don't even have to have PhDs, you know, they, some are high school dropouts, but are just brilliant minds who could really have succeeded anywhere, and they choose to do this because they love it. And I want people to understand that and to see the talent um, and the just the passion that the poker community has. I guess uh, in, in a perfect world, I would want the poker community to, to continue growing as it is. It is becoming more diverse. It's very healthy. I was worrying about when competing with Prague. Both are thriving. We just got 29 million in a prize pool with a 15 million guarantee. Prague also has record numbers. You need to get more women in the game. And am I saying I know how to do that? No. Am I saying that'd be unbelievable for the game? Yes. Because th there's there's a barrier of entry that, that's just there that we have to break down somehow. And it's not going to happen overnight, but it needs to happen. So in that dream world, it does happen. And instead of women making up 3 to 5% of a main event field, it starts to hit 10%. 15%, 20%. I want companies that have a little more heart. 
Um, and I feel like that has been happening lately that um, like the good guy companies are doing well. Um, Above the Felt is definitely helping that. I think that getting like good ambassadors who have spotless records, um, who actually want to grow the game and who are good people is a really great way to move poker forward because those are the people that are talking to new players, um, that are in the spotlight, that are getting articles written about them. We're hearing, oh, this person's doing th something for charity or they're doing an outreach program for women or they're doing whatever. It's, it's really good and I feel like that's how in the next five years we make poker a little bit better. I would just like to see a lot more of a collaborative effort amongst all parties involved. Whether we're talking about media, we're talking about influencers, we're talking about uh, you know the, the corporations or the operators. I think that there's room now where we've established enough um, industry leaders, so to speak, that it would become really critical to the community health as a whole for everybody to start operating together instead of competing against one another. Poker is definitely alive. Live poker is definitely very alive. And it's nice to be able to see it, as well as be conscientious that it exists, as well as be a part of it at a high level. Where I'm never gonna have an issue playing tournaments like this and bigger ones and other mains in the future, that there's always some stuff going on and it's a real blessing to be able to get to do it. Because I still love the game. Um, probably still more cash than tournaments. I'm working on being an in-boss. I don't know if I'll ever get to the, like the very top of the mountain where I'm like the in-boss of in-bosses, but I definitely uh, want to get to the part, I definitely want to get to the stage, we'll get back to the stage in my career where I come to the table and people don't want me there. In a perfect world, I would see online poker come back in the United States, kind of to pre-Black Friday levels where you could play in a lot of states and we had a combined market and you would be able to win satellites to live events like this. Kind of like bringing back the, the American ecosystem would be, would be a perfect world for me. I'm gonna continue to play, I'm, I'm still here, I'm still competing, I still enjoy it. So I see myself as a player and then a, a consultant behind the scenes and trying to help organize and advocate for the players, what players want and uh, what's good for the game. We have world champions, successful business people, entrepreneurs, best-selling author, keynote speakers, best-in-class broadcasters. We have industry-leading content creators. We have all these different people who have come from all walks of life. It isn't a community of degenerate gamblers. It is a community of dreamers. We're all dreamers. It is the dream that keeps us going. And I really believe the poker dream is still alive. I'm so all excited. In. It's so true. This is gonna be it's great. Gonna be really no, the issue is I'm just born in the Tom Brady era. So everything's all about like the next championship, like the next win or whatever, like nothing's good enough. And I can see how that's an issue. But that's where the mentality's at, which kinda sucks. So you're the Tom Brady of poker. No, yeah, he's not. One day. This isn't the short interview you've asked for, sir. So, yeah. Tell me your name. Oh, before we start. Um, Are we rolling now? Yeah. Whee! Yeah. <laughs> Who'd you say? <laughs> I'm not telling you what I said. <laughs> Did you get the question? Yeah. Who'd you say? You were moneymaker. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay. Yay, freedom. I hate my phone. I'm going to chuck this in the ocean when I'm done with it. In a pancake mode. Yeah. They were good. I'll make some for you. <laughs> it just, you know, it's again, it's a, it's a math game, and eventually, you know, I'll hit a big one. I love the uh, my time will come eventually part. <laughs> yeah, one day I'll win one. Chris Moneymaker. No comment. <laughs> um, and maybe uh, a little bit stronger by then too. <laughs> a little bit more mass. Yeah, I'm skinny now. I gotta get stronger. When I, when I busted, I got this pumped up. 
The guy gave me the old BANG! And I'm like, God damn it, back to back is gold. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's... I don't have anything, man. I'm just fucking... I don't actually have anything. I was gonna go down a rant of, like, bullshit, but I don't have anything, man. This is me. I'm 100 with you, and that's how I keep it on them streets. On the daily, I be grinding for my people, so they see. With only one life to live, I make sure I ain't on no need. Yeah, yeah, cause ain't no such things as halfway crooks. I don't even know how halfway looks. I do everything to the fullest, I hit like a bullet. No wonder your man stay shook. Uh huh, cause I gotta make it. It's time for the taking, the time and it's perfect. There ain't no debating, I'm showing the greatness. Yeah. yeah. I'm all in. I'm all in. Every morning, this is a call in. I'm